This is a video about evidence in your academic life and your everyday life. Let's face it, no one wants to look stupid, so this video can help you avoid doing just that. We're going to approach evidence from three different angles. The reasons you use evidence, the kinds of evidence you can use, and the effects these uses of evidence can have on your audience and the outcome of the situation. We're going to tell you the story of Octavian, your typical college dinosaur who is roommates with Jeffrey. They are not getting along because Jeffrey claims that Octavian never cleans up his mess. Their arguments never get resolved on this issue because Octavian never gives solid evidence or reasons as to why he is as messy as he is, but rather just gives generalizations. I'm a plant eater, so I couldn't be the one to leave all those caucuses here. They had to come from somewhere. But man, I'm like a guy. There's nothing wrong with being messy. We're also going to tell you the story of Petunia. This is Petunia. She has just received feedback from her economics instructor on her recently handed an essay on macroeconomics. The problem is that she wrote her essay using many generalizations. Petunia has received similar feedback before, but never really attempted to provide more evidence, whatever that is. Her grades on her paper are not getting better, but worse. I feel like you're being too general here. Give me some evidence to support your claims. For example, in your essay you wrote, Raising taxes would hurt America. It's not wrong what you're saying, but you have to back it up. Not all people will be convinced by the statement. Why do I need to prove everything? I ain't no scientist. In both of these situations, we have someone who is trying to convince someone of something, whether in real life or in a college classroom, but it isn't working. Both Octavian and Petunia aren't giving any evidence for their general claims. This makes them very sad because they are not getting the effects they want from their audience. Evidence and generalizations are opposites, but generalizations can be death when it comes to effective communication because your audience, whether it is your roommate or your macroeconomics teacher, desires evidence. So why give evidence? Well, there are three reasons why giving evidence is important. The first reason concerns self-presentation. You don't want to look stupid by making a claim and not giving evidence behind it. And if you're trying to impress your college professor, then you definitely do not want to come across in this way. The second reason is that your audience expects you to provide proof to buttress your argument and support your claims. Get it? Like the picture? A claim without evidence is like a building without supports. It just crumbles to the ground. And the architect looks really, really dumb. The third and final reason why you should provide evidence is that it continues conversations, both scholarly and personal. It gives the audience something specific to respond to and a point on which to step into the next stage of conversation. Now, back to our generalizers, Octavian and Petunia. After they gave their really general stories, they were like, Man, I didn't get the effects that I wanted. No one seemed to be convinced. They now wanted to know what kinds of evidence they could use that would help them better their own conversations and circumstances. So naturally, they went to the computer. More specifically, they went to myreviewers.usf.edu, a resource they remember from taking ENC 1101 and 1102. What they didn't remember was how much cool and informative stuff there was on the site. There's a whole section of the site devoted just to evidence, the evidence section. So. Back to Octavian. Now, when Jeffrey gets mad at him for leaving such a mess of carcasses all the time, there are two main kinds of evidence that Octavian can use. If he uses first-hand evidence, it would sound like this. But Jeffrey, I was studying. I had to order takeout and had this crazy exam that I had to pass if I wanted to get into med school. You know how much pressure my parents put on me. I swear, sometimes I wish I was extinct. If Octavian is to use second-hand evidence, it would look like this. But Jeffrey, in my psychology textbook in chapter 13, I learned that teenage dinosaurs commonly have trouble adjusting to college. One of the ways they show it is by not cleaning up. It's a biological, instinctual thing. In the wild, they're always leaving stuff around, expressing themselves. There was a New York Times article just last week written by a guest columnist named Steg Osaurus who made just such an argument. Then there's Petunia. Her situation, like Octavian's, could be vastly improved by simply providing some concrete evidence to support her claims made in her macroeconomics paper. For example, if Petunia were to provide first-hand evidence in her paper, she could talk about how her father's business... Raising taxes would hurt America. For example, my father, a hard-working middle-class business owner, had to lay off 10 employees when they raised taxes back in 1995, and we almost lost our house. Raising taxes does not help the middle class. Now, when it comes to second-hand evidence, Petunia did not have as easy a time as Octavian. To further support my point, I turned to internet research. I read something on Wikipedia about the U.S. tax system. I realized that citing Wikipedia in academic papers is not the most credible evidence and that this could be a problem. So I followed a link on the Wikipedia page that then led me to a news article from a conservative news source. 
I grabbed a quote and put it in my paper while revising. I then wanted to find another point of view, so I went to the e-journal section of the USF library and found something else on the effects of taxation in a prominent business journal, the Journal of America and Economy. So, this is all well and good, but how about the effects of using these kinds of evidence on their audience? Well, the way we think about effects of evidence is through the lens of ethos, logos, and pathos. If you'd like to know more about these terms, just click on them. In Octavian's situation, he built up his ethos when he provided credible information from experts in the field of dinosaur psychology about the realities of college life for a prehistoric creature. His claim that it is okay to be messy is backed up and supported by evidence, mostly the claims of other, more reliable people on the subject. This makes Octavian more trustworthy in Jeffrey's eyes. He used the appeal to logos effectively when he actually used those secondhand evidence sources in such a way that drew comparisons between the stressful college dinosaurs and himself, making an argument of identification by placing himself within a certain population of dinosaurs. This is a very difficult claim for Jeffrey to logically refute. He appealed to pathos and Jeffrey's emotions when he used personal, first-hand evidence about his dire academic situation and his family pressure. In this use of evidence, he was trying to appeal to Jeffrey's sense of sympathy. In Petunia's situation, a realistic one that many of you will have, she also engaged in different appeals in order to elicit better effects on her audience by the way that she used her evidence. Petunia built up her ethos in the eyes of the professor by providing evidence for her claim from both sides of the political spectrum. Acknowledging the validity of both points of view is a good way to use evidence to make your audience trust you more. Hint, hint. Petunia used the appeal to Logos when she quoted the source from the Journal of America and Economy that stated that tax hikes put too much pressure on small business owners and forces those within mid-range tax brackets to forfeit too much of their hard work. Petunia also incorporated first-hand evidence in such a way that she evoked pathos, an emotional response in the audience, in this case her professor. Her mentioning about how tax breaks also cost her family their house and her shot at college makes the audience feel sorry for hardworking Americans and persuades the audience that this instance is a good piece of evidence to support her position. So great, Octavian and Petunia used the content from my reviewers and made a concerted effort to provide more evidence and it had great effects for their audience. This is good, but it's important to note that simply finding and using evidence does not guarantee getting positive effects from your audience. Sometimes using evidence, if used improperly, can have potentially negative effects from what you want. So two quick warnings. First, your evidence needs to come from sources that the audience sees as credible. If you use sources that are not credible in your audience's eyes, your audience will be incredulous. This guy clearly does not like your evidence, and this is the best case. Others might just be plain angry at your use of evidence and say, no way am I listening to your argument because it was stupid, the evidence you brought in. It has to be credible. Second warning, your evidence must be blended with your own points and carefully edited to make the point you want it to make, not just thrust out as if it were self-evident. You don't just want to put a huge bit of evidence that is not appropriately integrated and connected to what you yourself are saying in the paper. Like if you said, here's evidence, evidence, evidence. It's like saying, here, eat all this tofu all by itself. Eat it. But nobody wants to eat plain tofu. If you carefully take the right amount of evidence and shape it for your source, it's like blending all the ingredients together into delicious soup. Your audience loves soup, and so do dinosaurs. Thanks. <laughs>